This book is brought to you by Book Brain Community. Like, share, subscribe for more and more books. Chapter 7 The next morning, as he brewed black tea for breakfast, Hassan told me he'd had a dream. We were at Garga Lake, you, me, father, Aga Sahib, Rahim Khan, and thousands of other people, he said. It was warm and sunny, and the lake was clear like a mirror. But no one was swimming because they said a monster had come to the lake. It was swimming at the bottom, waiting. He poured me a cup and added sugar, blew on it a few times. Put it before me. So everyone is scared to get in the water, and suddenly you kick off your shoes, a mirror Aga, and take off your shirt. There's no monster, you say. I'll show you all. And before anyone can stop you, you dive into the water, start swimming away. I follow you in and we're both swimming. But you can't swim. Hassan laughed. It's a dream, Amir Aga, you can do anything. Anyway, everyone is screaming, get out, get out, but we just swim in the cold water. We make it way out to the middle of the lake and we stop swimming. We turn toward the shore and wave to the people. They look small like ants, but we can hear them clapping. They see now. There is no monster, just water. They change the name of the lake after that, and call it the Lake of Amir and Hassan, Sultans of Kabul, and we get to charge people money for swimming in it. So what does it mean? I said. He coated my naan with marmalade, placed it on a plate. I don't know. I was hoping you could tell me. Well, it's a dumb dream. Nothing happens in it. Father says dreams always mean something. I sipped some tea. Why don't you ask him, then? He's so smart, I said, more curtly than I had intended. I hadn't slept all night. My neck and back were like coiled springs, and my eyes stung. Still, I had been mean to Hassan. I almost apologized, then didn't. Hassan understood I was just nervous. Hassan always understood about me. Upstairs, I could hear the water running in Baba's bathroom. The streets glistened with fresh snow and the sky was a blameless blue. Snow blanketed every rooftop and weighed on the branches of the stunted mulberry trees that lined our street. Overnight, snow had nudged its way into every crack and gutter. I squinted against the blinding white wet Hassan and I stepped through the wrought iron gates. Ali shut the gates behind us. I heard him mutter a prayer under his breath. He always said a prayer when his son left the house. I had never seen so many people on our street. Kids were flinging snowballs, squabbling, chasing one another, giggling. Kite fighters were huddling with their school holders, making last-minute preparations. From adjacent streets, I could hear laughter and chatter. Already, rooftops were jammed with spectators reclining in lawn chairs, hot tea steaming from thermoses, and the music of Ahmad Zahir blaring from cassette players. The immensely popular Ahmad Zahir had revolutionized Afghan music and outraged the purists by adding electric guitars, drums, and horns to the traditional tabla and harmonium. On stage or at parties, he shirked the austere and nearly morose stance of older singers and actually smiled when he sang, sometimes even at women. I turned my gaze to our rooftop, found Baba and Rahim Khan sitting on a bench, both dressed in wool sweaters, sipping tea. Baba waved. I couldn't tell if he was waving at me or Hassan. We should get started, Hassan said. He wore black rubber snow boots and a bright green chapin over a thick sweater and faded corduroy pants. Sunlight washed over his face, and, in it, I saw how well the pink scar above his lip had healed. Suddenly I wanted to withdraw. Pack it all in, go back home. What was I thinking? Why was I putting myself through this, when I already knew the outcome? Baba was on the roof, watching me. I felt his glare on me like the heat of a blistering sun. This would be failure on a grand scale, even for me. I'm not sure I want to fly a kite today, I said. It's a beautiful day, Hassan said. I shifted on my feet. Tried to peel my gaze away from our rooftop. I don't know. Maybe we should go home. Then he stepped toward me and, in a low voice, said something that scared me a little. Remember, Amir Aga, there's no monster, just a beautiful day. How could I be such an open book to him when, half the time, I had no idea what was milling around in his head? I was the one who went to school, the one who could read, write. I was the smart one. Hassan couldn't read a first grade textbook but he'd read me plenty. That was a little unsettling, but also sort of comfortable to have someone who always knew what you needed. No monster, I said, feeling a little better, to my own surprise. He smiled, no monster. Are you sure? He closed his eyes, nodded. 
I look to the kids scampering down the street, flinging snowballs. It is a beautiful day, isn't it? Let's fly, he said. It occurred to me then that maybe Hassan had made up his dream. Was that possible? I decided it wasn't. Hassan wasn't that smart. I wasn't that smart. But made up or not, the silly dream had lifted some of my anxiety. Maybe I should take off my shirt, take a swim in the lake. Why not? Let's do it, I said. Hassan's face brightened. Good, he said. He lifted our kite, red with yellow borders, and, just beneath where the central and cross spars met, marked with Safo's unmistakable signature. He licked his finger and held it up, tested the wind, then ran in its direction. On those rare occasions we flew kites in the summer, he'd kick up dust to see which way the wind blew it. The scroll rolled in my hands until Hassan stopped, about 50 feet away. He held the kite high over his head, like an Olympic athlete showing his gold medal. I jerked the string twice, our usual signal, and Hassan tossed the kite. Caught between Baba and the mullahs at school, I still hadn't made up my mind about God. But when a Quranayat I had learned in my Dinayat class rose to my lips, I muttered it. I took a deep breath, exhaled, and pulled on the string. Within a minute, my kite was rocketing to the sky. It made a sound like a paper bird flapping its wings. Hassan clapped his hands, whistled, and ran back to me. I handed him the spool, holding on to the string, and he spun it quickly to roll the loose string back on. At least two dozen kites already hung in the sky, like paper sharks roaming for prey. Within an hour, the number doubled, and red, blue, and yellow kites glided and spun in the sky. A cold breeze wafted through my hair. The wind was perfect for kite flying, blowing just hard enough to give some lift, make the sweeps easier. Next to me, Hassan held the spool, his hands already bloodied by the string. Soon, the cutting started and the first of the defeated kites whirled out of control. They fell from the sky like shooting stars with brilliant, rippling tails, showering the neighborhoods below with prizes for the kite runners. I could hear the runners now, hollering as they ran the streets. Someone shouted reports of a fight breaking out two streets down. I kept stealing glances at Baba sitting with Rahim Khan on the roof, wondered what he was thinking. Was he cheering for me? Or did a part of him enjoy watching me fail? That was the thing about kite flying, your mind drifted with the kite. They were coming down all over the place now, the kites, and I was still flying. I was still flying. My eyes kept wandering over to Baba, bundled up in his wool sweater. Was he surprised I had lasted as long as I had? You don't keep your eyes to the sky, you won't last much longer. I snapped my gaze back to the sky. A red kite was closing in on me, I'd caught it just in time. I tangled a bit with it, ended up besting him when he became impatient and tried to cut me from below. Up and down the streets, kite runners were returning triumphantly, their captured kites held high. They showed them off to their parents, their friends. But they all knew the best was yet to come. The biggest prize of all was still flying. I sliced a bright yellow kite with a coiled white tail. It cost me another gash on the index finger and blood trickled down into my palm. I had Hassan hold the string and suck the blood dry, blotted my finger against my jeans. Within another hour, the number of surviving kites dwindled from maybe 50 to a dozen. I was one of them. I'd made it to the last dozen. I knew this part of the tournament would take a while, because the guys who had lasted this long were good, they wouldn't easily fall into simple traps like the old lift and dive, Hassan's favorite trick. By three o'clock that afternoon, tufts of clouds had drifted in and the sun had slipped behind them. Shadows started to lengthen. The spectators on the roofs bundled up in scarves and thick coats. We were down to a half dozen and I was still flying. My legs ached and my neck was stiff. But with each defeated kite, hope grew in my heart, like snow collecting on a wall, one flake at a time. My eyes kept returning to a blue kite that had been wreaking havoc for the last hour. How many has he cut? I asked. I counted eleven, Hassan said. Do you know whose it might be? Hassan plucked his tongue and tipped his chin. That was a trademark Hassan gesture, meant he had no idea. 
The blue kite sliced a big purple one and swept twice in big loops. Ten minutes later, he'd cut another two, sending hordes of kite runners racing after them. After another thirty minutes, only four kites remained, and I was still flying. It seemed I could hardly make a wrong move, as if every gust of wind blew in my favor. I'd never felt so in command, so lucky. It felt intoxicating, I didn't dare look up to the roof. Didn't dare take my eyes off the sky. I had to concentrate, play it smart. Another fifteen minutes and what had seemed like a laughable dream that morning had suddenly become reality, it was just me and the other guy. The blue kite. The tension in the air was as taut as the glass string I was tugging with my bloody hands. People were stomping their feet, clapping, whistling, chanting, Babarash. Babarash, cut him, cut him. I wondered if Baba's voice was one of them. Music blasted. The smell of steamed mantu and fried pakora drifted from rooftops and open doors. But all I heard, all I willed myself to hear, was the thudding of blood in my head. All I saw was the blue kite. All I smelled was victory. Salvation. Redemption. If Baba was wrong and there was a god like they said in school, then he'd let me win. I didn't know what the other guy was playing for, maybe just bragging rights. But this was my one chance to become someone who was looked at, not seen, listened to, not heard. If there was a god, he'd guide the winds, let them blow for me so that, with a tug of my string, I'd cut loose my pain, my longing. I'd endure too much, come too far. And suddenly, just like that, hope became knowledge. I was going to win. It was just a matter of when. It turned out to be sooner than later. A gust of wind lifted my kite and I took advantage. Fed the string, pulled up. Looped my kite on top of the blue one. I held position. The blue kite knew it was in trouble. It was trying desperately to maneuver out of the jam, but I didn't let go. I held position. The crowd sensed the end was at hand. The chorus of, cut him, cut him, grew louder, like Romans chanting for the gladiators to kill, kill. You're almost there, Amir Agha, almost there, Hassan was panting. Then the moment came. I closed my eyes and loosened my grip on the string. It sliced my fingers again as the wind dragged it. And then, I didn't need to hear the crowd's roar to know. I didn't need to see either. Hassan was screaming and his arm was wrapped around my neck. Bravo, bravo, Amir Aga. I opened my eyes, saw the blue kite spinning wildly like a tire come loose from a speeding car. I blinked, tried to say something. Nothing came out. Suddenly I was hovering, looking down on myself from above. Black leather coat, red scarf, faded jeans. A thin boy, a little sallow, and a tad short for his twelve years. He had narrow shoulders and a hint of dark circles around his pale hazel eyes. The breeze rustled his light brown hair. He looked up to me and we smiled at each other. Then I was screaming, and everything was color and sound, everything was alive and good. I was throwing my free arm around Hassan and we were hopping up and down, both of us laughing, both of us weeping. You won, Amir Aga. You won. We won, we won, was all I could say. This wasn't happening. In a moment, I'd blink and rouse from this beautiful dream, get out of bed, march down to the kitchen to eat breakfast with no one to talk to but Hassan. Get dressed, wait for Baba, give up, back to my old life. Then I saw Baba on our roof. He was standing on the edge, pumping both of his fists, hollering and clapping. And that right there was the single greatest moment of my twelve years of life, seeing Baba on that roof, proud of me at last. But he was doing something now, motioning with his hands in an urgent way. Then I understood. Hassan, we. Oui. I know, he said, breaking our embrace. Inshallah, we'll celebrate later. Right now, I'm going to run that blue kite for you, he said. He dropped the spool and took off running, the hem of his green chapin dragging in the snow behind him. Hassan, I called, come back with it. He was already turning the street corner, his rubber boots kicking up snow. He stopped, turned, he cupped his hands around his mouth. For you a thousand times over, he said. 
Then he smiled his Hassan smile and disappeared around the corner. The next time I saw him smile unabashedly like that was 26 years later, in a faded Polaroid photograph. I began to pull my kite back as people rushed to congratulate me. I shook hands with them, said my thanks. The younger kids looked at me with an awestruck twinkle in their eyes, I was a hero. Hands patted my back and tousled my hair. I pulled on the string and returned every smile, but my mind was on the blue kite. Finally, I had my kite in hand. I wrapped the loose string that had collected at my feet around the school, shook a few more hands, and trotted home. When I reached the wrought iron gates, Ali was waiting on the other side. He stuck his hand through the bars. Congratulations, he said. I gave him my kite at school, shook his hand. Tashakor, Ali Jan. I was praying for you the whole time. Then keep praying, we're not done yet. I hurried back to the street. I didn't ask Ali about Baba, I didn't want to see him yet. In my head, I had it all planned. I'd make a grand entrance, a hero, prize trophy in my bloodied hands. Heads would turn and eyes would lock. Rostam and Sorab sizing each other up. A dramatic moment of silence. Then the old warrior would walk to the young one, embrace him. Acknowledge his worthiness, vindication, salvation, redemption, and then, well, happily ever after, of course, what else? The streets of Wazir Akbar Khan were numbered and set at right angles to each other like a grid. It was a new neighborhood then, still developing, with empty lots of land and half-constructed homes on every street between compounds surrounded by eight-foot walls. I ran up and down every street, looking for Hassan. Everywhere, people were busy folding chairs, packing food and utensils after a long day of partying. Some, still sitting on their rooftops, shouted their congratulations to me. Four streets south of ours, I saw Omar, the son of an engineer who was a friend of Baba's. He was dribbling a soccer ball with his brother on the front lawn of their house. Omar was a pretty good guy. We'd been classmates in fourth grade, and one time he'd given me a fountain pen, the kind you had to load with a cartridge. I heard you won, Amir, he said. Congratulations. Thanks. Have you seen Hassan? You're Hazara. I nodded. Omar headed the ball to his brother. I hear he's a great kite runner. His brother headed the ball back to him. Omar caught it, tossed it up and down. Although I've always wondered how he manages. I mean, with those tight little eyes, how does he see anything? His brother laughed, a short burst, and asked for the ball. Omar ignored him. Have you seen him? Omar flicked a thumb over his shoulder, pointing southwest. I saw him running toward the bazaar a while ago. Thanks, I scuttled away. By the time I reached the marketplace, the sun had almost sunk behind the hills and dusk had painted the sky pink and purple. A few blocks away, from the Haji Yago Mosque, the mullah bellowed his on, calling for the faithful to unroll their rugs and bow their heads west in prayer. Hassan never missed any of the five daily prayers. Even when we were out playing, he'd excuse himself, draw water from the well in the yard, wash up, and disappear into the hut. He'd come out a few minutes later, smiling, find me sitting against the wall or perched on a tree. He was going to miss prayer tonight, though, because of me. The bazaar was emptying quickly, the merchants finishing up their haggling for the day. I trotted in the mud between rows of closely packed cubicles where you could buy a freshly slaughtered pheasant in one stand and a calculator from the adjacent one. I picked my way through the dwindling crowd, the lame beggars dressed in layers of tattered rags, the vendors with rugs on their shoulders, the cloth merchants and butchers closing shop for the day. I found no sign of Hassan. I stopped by a dried fruit stand, described Hassan to an old merchant loading his mule with crates of pine seeds and raisins. He wore a powder blue turban. He paused to look at me for a long time before answering. I might have seen him. Which way did he go? He eyed me up and down. What is a boy like you doing here at this time of the day looking for a Hazara? His glance lingered admiringly on my leather coat and my jeans, cowboy pants, we used to call them. In Afghanistan, owning anything American, especially if it wasn't secondhand, was a sign of wealth. 
I need to find him, Aga. What is he to you? He said. I didn't see the point of his question, but I reminded myself that impatience wasn't going to make him tell me any faster. He's our servant's son, I said. The old man raised a pepper gray eyebrow. He is. Lucky Hazara, having such a concerned master. His father should get on his knees, sweep the dust at your feet with his eyelashes. Are you going to tell me or not? He rested an arm on the mule's back, pointed south. I think I saw the boy you described running that way. He had a kite in his hand, a blue one. He did, I said. For you a thousand times over, he promised. Good old Hassan, good old reliable Hassan. He kept his promise and run the last kite for me. Of course, they've probably caught him by now, the old merchant said, grunting and loading another box on the mule's back. Who? The other boys, he said, the ones chasing him, they were dressed like you. He glanced to the sky and sighed. Now, run along, you're making me late for namaz. But I was already scrambling down the lane. For the next few minutes, I scoured the bazaar in vain. Maybe the old merchant's eyes had betrayed him, except he'd seen the blue kite. The thought of getting my hands on that kite, I poked my head behind every lane, every shop. No sign of Hassan. I had begun to worry that darkness would fall before I found Hassan when I heard voices from up ahead. I'd reached a secluded, muddy road. It ran perpendicular to the end of the main thoroughfare bisecting the bazaar. I turned onto the rutted track and followed the voices. My boots squished in mud with every step and my breath puffed out in white clouds before me. The narrow path ran parallel on one side to a snow-filled ravine through which a stream may have tumbled in the spring. To my other side stood. Rows of snow-burdened cypress trees peppered among flat-topped clay houses, no more than mud shacks in most cases, separated by narrow alleys. I heard the voices again, louder this time, coming from one of the alleys. I crept close to the mouth of the alley, held my breath, peeked around the corner. Hassan was standing at the blind end of the alley in a defiant stance, fists curled, legs slightly apart. Behind him, sitting on piles of scrap and rubble, was the blue kite. My key to Baba's heart. Blocking Hassan's way out of the alley were three boys, the same three from that day on the hill, the day after Daud Khan's coup, when Hassan had saved us with his slingshot. Wally was standing on one side, Kamal on the other, and in the middle, Asef. I felt my body clench up, and something cold rippled up my spine. Asef seemed relaxed, confident. He was twirling his brass knuckles. The other two guys shifted nervously on their feet, looking from Asef to Hassan, like they'd cornered some kind of wild animal that only Asef could tame. Where is your slingshot, Hazara? Asef said, turning the brass knuckles in his hand. What was it you said? They'll have to call you Oneidas F. That's right, Oneidas F. That was clever, really clever. Then again, it's easy to be clever when you're holding a loaded weapon. I realized I still hadn't breathed out. I exhaled, slowly, quietly. I felt paralyzed. I watched them close in on the boy I'd grown up with, the boy whose hair-lipped face had been my first memory. But today is your lucky day, Hazara, Asef said. He had his back to me, but I would have bet he was grinning. I'm in a mood to forgive. What do you say to that, boys? That's generous, Kamal blurted, especially after the rude manners he showed us last time. He was trying to sound like Asef, except there was a tremor in his voice. Then I understood. He wasn't afraid of Hassan, not really. He was afraid because he had no idea what Asef had in mind. Asef waved a dismissive hand. Bashida, forgiven, it's done. His voice dropped a little. Of course, nothing is free in this world, and my pardon comes with a small price. That's fair, Kamal said. Nothing is free, Wally added. You're a lucky Hazara, Asef said, taking a step toward Hassan. Because today, it's only going to cost you that blue kite. A fair deal, boys, isn't it? More than fair, Kamal said. Even from where I was standing, I could see the fear creeping into Hassan's eyes, but he shook his head. Amir Aga won the tournament and I ran this kite for him. 
I ran it fairly, this is his kite. A loyal Hazara, loyal as a dog, Asef said. Kamal's laugh was a shrill, nervous sound. But before you sacrifice yourself for him, think about this, would he do the same for you? Have you ever wondered why he never includes you in games when he has guests? Why he only plays with you when no one else is around? I'll tell you why, Hazara. Because to him, you're nothing but an ugly pet. Something he can play with when he's bored, something he can kick when he's angry. Don't ever fool yourself and think you're something more. Amir Aga and I are friends, Hassan said. He looked flushed. Friends, Asef said, laughing, you pathetic fool. Someday you'll wake up from your little fantasy and learn just how good of a friend he is. Now, bah, enough of this, give us the kite. Hassan stooped and picked up a rock. Asef flinched. He began to take a step back, stopped. Last chance, Hazara. Hassan's answer was to cock the arm that held the rock. Whatever you wish. Asef unbuttoned his winter coat, took it off, folded it slowly and deliberately. He placed it against the wall. I opened my mouth, almost said something. Almost. The rest of my life might have turned out differently if I had. But I didn't, I just watched, paralyzed. Asef motioned with his hand, and the other two boys separated, forming a half circle, trapping Hassan in the alley. I've changed my mind, Asef said. I'm letting you keep the kite, Hazara. I'll let you keep it so it will always remind you of what I'm about to do. Then he charged. Hassan hurled the rock. It struck Asef in the forehead. Asef yelped as he flung himself at Hassan, knocking him to the ground. Wally and Kamal followed. I bit on my fist. Shut my eyes. A memory. Did you know Hassan and you fed from the same breast? Did you know that, Amir Agha, Sakina, her name was? She was a fair, blue-eyed Hazara woman from Bamiyan and she sang you old wedding songs. They say there is a brotherhood between people who fed from the same breast. Did you know that? A memory. A rupee each, children. Just one rupee each and I will part the curtain of truth. The old man sits against a mud wall. His sightless eyes are like molten silver embedded in deep, twin craters. Hunched over his cane, the fortune teller runs a gnarled hand across the surface of his deflated cheeks. Cups it before us. Not much to ask for the truth, is it, a rupee each? Hassan drops a coin in the leathery palm. I drop mine too. In the name of Allah most beneficent, most merciful, the old fortune teller whispers. He takes Hassan's hand first, strokes the palm with one horn-like fingernail, round and round, round and round. The finger then floats to Hassan's face and makes a dry, scratchy sound as it slowly traces the curve of his cheeks, the outline of his ears. The callous pads of his fingers brush against Hassan's eyes. The hand stops there, lingers. A shadow passes across the old man's face. Hassan and I exchange a glance. The old man takes Hassan's hand and puts the rupiah back in Hassan's palm. He turns to me. How about you, young friend? He says. On the other side of the wall, a rooster crows. The old man reaches for my hand and I withdraw it. A dream. I am lost in a snowstorm. The wind shrieks, blows stinging sheets of snow into my eyes. I stagger through layers of shifting white. I call for help but the wind drowns my cries. I fall and lie panting on the snow, lost in the white, the wind wailing in my ears. I watch the snow erase my fresh footprints. I'm a ghost now, I think, a ghost with no footprints. I cry out again, hope fading like my footprints. But this time, a muffled reply. I shield my eyes and manage to sit up. Out of the swaying curtains of snow, I catch a glimpse of movement, a flurry of color. A familiar shape materializes, a hand reaches out for me. I see deep, parallel gashes across the palm, blood dripping, staining the snow. I take the hand and suddenly the snow is gone. 
We're standing in a field of apple green grass with soft wisps of clouds drifting above. I look up and see the clear sky is filled with kites, green, yellow, red, orange. They shimmer in the afternoon light. A havoc of scrap and rubble littered the alley. Worn bicycle tires, bottles with peeled labels, ripped up magazines, yellowed newspapers, all scattered amid a pile of bricks and slabs of cement. A rusted cast iron stove with a gaping hole on its side tilted against a wall. But there were two things amid the garbage that I couldn't stop looking at, one was the blue kite resting. Against the wall, close to the cast iron stove, the other was Hassan's brown corduroy pants thrown on a heap of eroded bricks. I don't know, Wally was saying. My father says it's sinful. He sounded unsure, excited, scared, all at the same time. Hassan lay with his chest pinned to the ground. Gamal and Wally each gripped an arm, twisted and bent at the elbow so that Hassan's hands were pressed to his back. Asaf was standing over them, the heel of his snow boots crushing the back of Hassan's neck. Your father won't find out, Asaf said. And there's nothing sinful about teaching a lesson to a disrespectful donkey. I don't know, Wally muttered. Suit yourself, Asaf said. He turned to Kamal. What about you? I, well. It's just a Hazara, Asaf said. But Kamal kept looking away. Fine, Asef snapped. All I want you weaklings to do is hold him down. Can you manage that? Wally and Kamal nodded. They looked relieved. Asef knelt behind Hassan, put his hands on Hassan's hips and lifted his bare buttocks. He kept one hand on Hassan's back and undid his own belt buckle with his free hand. He unzipped his jeans, dropped his underwear. He positioned himself behind Hassan. Hassan didn't struggle, didn't even whimper. He moved his head slightly and I caught a glimpse of his face. Saw the resignation in it. It was a look I had seen before. It was the look of the lamb. Tomorrow is the tenth day of Dhul Hijjah, the last month of the Muslim calendar, and the first of three days of Eid al-Adha, or Eid Korban, as Afghans call it, a day to celebrate how the Prophet Ibrahim almost sacrificed his own. Son for God. Baba has handpicked the sheep again this year, a powder white one with crooked black ears. We all stand in the backyard, Hassan, Ali, Baba, and I. The mullah recites the prayer, rubs his beard. Baba mutters, get on with it, under his breath. He sounds annoyed with the endless praying, the ritual of making the meat halal. Baba mocks the story behind this Eid, like he mocks everything religious but he respects the tradition of Edi Corbin. The custom is to divide the meat in thirds, one for the family, one for friends, and one for the poor. Every year, Baba gives it all to the poor. The rich are fat enough already, he says. The mullah finishes the prayer. I mean, he picks up the kitchen knife with the long blade. The custom is to not let the sheep see the knife. Ali feeds the animal a cube of sugar, another custom, to make death sweeter. The sheep kicks, but not much. The mullah grabs it under its jaw and places the blade on its neck. Just a second before he slices the throat in one expert motion, I see the sheep's eyes. It is a look that will haunt my dreams for weeks. I don't know why I watch this yearly ritual in our backyard, my nightmares persist long after the bloodstains on the grass have faded. But I always watch. I watch because of that look of acceptance in the animal's eyes. Absurdly, I imagine the animal understands. I imagine the animal sees that its imminent demise is for a higher purpose. This is the look. I stopped watching, turned away from the alley. Something warm was running down my wrist. I blinked, saw I was still biting down on my fist, hard enough to draw blood from the knuckles. I realized something else. I was weeping. From just around the corner, I could hear Asef's quick, rhythmic grunts. I had one last chance to make a decision. One final opportunity to decide who I was going to be. I could step into that alley, stand up for Hassan, the way he'd stood up for me all those times in the past, and accept whatever would happen to me. Or I could run. In the end, I ran. I ran because I was a coward. 
I was afraid of Asaph and what he would do to me. I was afraid of getting hurt. That's what I told myself as I turned my back to the alley to Hassan. That's what I made myself believe. I actually aspired to cowardice because the alternative, the real reason I was running, was that Asaph was right, nothing was free in this world. Maybe Hassan was the price I had to pay, the lamb I had to slay, to win Baba. Was it a fair price? The answer floated to my conscious mind before I could thwart it, he was just a Hazara, wasn't he? I ran back the way I'd come, ran back to the all but deserted bazaar. I lurched to a cubicle and leaned against the padlock swinging doors. I stood there panting, sweating, wishing things had turned out some other way. About 15 minutes later, I heard voices and running footfalls. I crouched behind the cubicle and watched Asef and the other two sprinting by, laughing as they hurried down the deserted lane. I forced myself to wait 10 more minutes. Then I walked back to the rutted track that ran along the snow-filled ravine. I squinted in the dimming light and spotted Hassan. Walking slowly toward me, I met him by a leafless birch tree on the edge of the ravine. He had the blue kite in his hands, that was the first thing I saw. And I can't lie now and say my eyes didn't scan it for any rips. His chapin had mud smudges down the front and his shirt was ripped just below the collar. He stopped, swayed on his feet like he was going to collapse. Then he steadied himself, handed me the kite. Where were you? I looked for you, I said. Speaking those words was like chewing on a rock. Hassan dragged a sleeve across his face, wiped snot and tears. I waited for him to say something, but we just stood there in silence, in the fading light. I was grateful for the early evening shadows that fell on Hassan's face and concealed mine. I was glad I didn't have to return his gaze. Did he know I knew? And if he knew, then what would I see if I did look in his eyes? Blame, indignation, or, God forbid, what I feared most, guileless devotion. That, most of all, I couldn't bear to see. He began to say something and his voice cracked. He closed his mouth, opened it, and closed it again. Took a step back, wiped his face. And that was as close as Hassan and I ever came to discussing what had happened in the alley. I thought he might burst into tears, but, to my relief, he didn't, and I pretended I hadn't heard the crack in his voice. Just like I pretended I hadn't seen the dark stain in the seat of his pants. Or those tiny drops that fell from between his legs and stained the snow black. Aga Sahib will worry, was all he said. He turned from me and limped away. It happened just the way I'd imagined. I opened the door to the smoky study and stepped in. Baba and Rahim Khan were drinking tea and listening to the news crackling on the radio. Their heads turned. Then a smile played on my father's lips. He opened his arms. I put the kite down and walked into his thick hairy arms. I buried my face in the warmth of his chest and wept. Baba held me close to him, rocking me back and forth. In his arms, I forgot what I'd done, and that was good.